Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Bill Whitney of Calderwood Percussion. Bill, welcome to the show. Thanks, man. Happy to be here. Yeah, this is uh, this is a, another, like usual, long one in the making. Um, I We met and talked at uh, the Chicago show, or it might have been PASIC. Yeah, I, th- I think it was PASIC a couple yeah, years ago. Yeah, back when the world was... Um, <laughs> Yeah, when, when those sort of things were a thing. Yeah, when we could be around each other. And uh, we talked about, you know, doing a rope tension thing. And here we are um, basically two years later. Um, yeah. And uh, we're making it happen. So um, you're the owner and operator of Calderwood Percussion. Obviously, you're a performer and a teacher and all this cool stuff. But uh, yeah, so today we are covering the history of rope tension drums, something that you are very, very passionate about. So why don't we jump in a little bit and, and you can kind of just tell us about the background on this, this amazing, you know, type of tension. And, and I always say this, don't like assume that anyone knows anything. Cause this is something that I know very little about, um, about how it holds the tension and the little, like, kind of like you know, I guess they're called ears or whatever that, that hold it on. Um, yeah, ears, unless you're in England, in which case they're called buffs. Buffs. Okay. N- neither name makes any sense to me, but that's <laughs> yeah. what they're called. No. no. So, but anyway, just kind of lay it all out there. Like you're talking to a uh, first grader here about uh, <laughs> rope tension drums in the history. Okay. Um, so first of all, this subject is pretty infinite and, uh, my sort of range of, of knowledge is primarily um, drums as they exist in Western music. Sure. So, uh, you know, th- there's obviously a huge culture tra- tradition with uh, Native Americans and I think indigenous peoples of everywhere to have to have all kinds of drums. And of course, there, there's the whole African tradition. I don't know a lot about that. But uh, from the sort of, you know, Eurocentric musical world that I'm knowledgeable about. Mm-hmm. Um, I can say that uh, it, it goes back, it goes back a long time. So basically where, I, where my knowledge kind of, kind of picks up and, and, and is admittedly spotty, but is, is kind of like 10th, 11th century, right? Where uh, the, the earliest instruments that, that I know about drums, uh, we would call it a tabor. And I, I've seen depictions going back as far as like the early 11th century, but uh, I've seen a lot more stuff that has like more accuracy or detail in like the 13th century to the 16th century where these drums, these, these tabers, it would be kind of small by like our standards, like somewhere in the neighborhood of like 12 inches in diameter. Sure. And uh, earlier on they they were on the shallower side. So maybe like between four and 10 inches deep. Gotcha. Typically these would have, Usually calf skin, but maybe goat or maybe horse, but some kind of skin head. The drums would be made of wood. Uh, construction, honestly, I, I think I think there's a lot of, of variance there, whether it was a hollowed out log or or a steam bent uh, board. I think the the steam bending would probably be the the most common thing you would, you would see looking back that far. Uh, stave construction actually goes way back. I mean, as long as we've had barrels, you know, mm-hmm. the stave drums have existed as well. But uh, but yeah, some kind of wooden shell with natural skins on each side, and the skins were tensioned with rope. Um, back then, there weren't, to the best of my knowledge, there weren't counter hoops. So the the skin would be tucked on a flesh hoop, and the flesh hoop, unlike the aluminum U channel that. Uh, modern day uh, mylar heads are, are epoxied into that aluminum U channel, right? But back then uh, it would be a flesh hoop. So you'd have the skin that was tucked or lapped, if you're British, uh, onto the flesh hoop, which would normally be made of, of wood. Um, but it was not unusual to see it made out of rope, actually, hmm. uh, especially for, you know back back from that time period. But so these drums would have uh, the the rope that was tensioning the drum would actually pass through the skins. Um, and, uh, and be pulling against that flesh hoop, you know? So there's no counter hoop on the drum. Hmm, interesting. And for snares, if they had snares, it would usually be one or maybe two strands of gut. Um, and when you look at, at old artwork, like, like, um, like drawings from like Pretorius or whatever, or like old tapestries and stuff, you very often see the, the snare gut is on the batter head. 
Um, or or on both heads. Although I I you know there's there's a, a wealth of knowledge out there beyond what I'm what I'm talking about. But from what from what I've seen, I've seen very few images where you can see the bottom of the drum. Sure. Yeah. Really. So uh, I can't say for sure that having guts on only the batter head was was the thing, or if on both heads. But yeah, so you have one or two strands, and uh, that would either be in, in earlier drawings, you usually just see it where it's like tied on. Uh, eventually, it would be secured with a friction peg, just like on a violin or a cello, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, and that's how it would be tensioned. So though those drums, uh, tabers, you know, that was was a really popular thing, and a very popular style of playing was what's called pipe and tabor, right? So the you would hold the drum on a on a strap, and you'd hang it over your left forearm right so you'd, you'd have it hanging off your arm and you would play it with a stick in your right hand and then with your left hand you would be playing a pipe which is similar to a modern day recorder except it only had three holes down at the bottom and it was uh, like a diatonic uh overblown flute so you'd you know you could play diatonic scales and you just sort of like overblow through the partials hmm. uh so it only had three holes but you could still play you know an octave and a half or, or possibly two octaves of a diatonic scale uh so musicians would play the melodies on on pipe and accompany themselves with their tabor. So kind of a one man band kind of thing, you know? Yeah, I, I found a cool picture of it online. It's like your your I guess left arm, like you said, is kind of going through that loop, holding the drum, and then also holding the the uh, the pipe. And so, what era would that be then? I mean, I know you said like eleventh century, but are we so is, are we kind of looking at that that time period for this? Um. Up, I mean that this was this was common for a very long time. I mean, you see a lot of depictions of that up, up like into the 16th century. Gotcha. Um, or, or even later, I think. Uh, hmm. the, actually, Shakespeare mentions it. Um, there's I can't remember what play this is from, but there's this. Uh, I, I can't even remember the the exact line, but but the the point of it is, you know, one character talking to another, saying, you know, when did you trade the pipe and tabor for the fife and the drum? Hmm. Uh, which which basically means like pipe and tabor is love songs and fife and drum is is military songs you know mm. battle and um, so this tradition of, of this sort of like romantic musical style goes existed for a very long time as we get as we get uh, a little bit further on in time like like getting into the 16th century you see the tabor be much deeper and um, uh, for instance the tambour and provençal which is uh, a much much deeper than it than the diameter drum uh you'd, you'd see them like well the ones i make are are 24 by 14 but uh even even larger drums are you, you see images of and uh that actually has a place in modern orchestra too like like uh the uh Ferendal and the was it lurcien by bizet or like uh copeland uses it in a few pieces uh messian uses it um hmm. So some of these ancient instruments do do have actual modern orchestral um, cool. sort of uh, implementations, but uh, so with these tabers throughout this whole time period that we're discussing, uh, skinheads, uh, wooden shell, that's all you know ubiquitous uh, with sure. with the rope tensioning. Sometimes you'll see the rope just laced around, and that's it. Uh, other times you would see it with ears or buffs, and uh, if if you're unfamiliar. An, an ear is basically so if you imagine the the drum with the rope being laced up and down the rope forms like triangle shapes all the way around the drum right yeah and uh so at the at the top of each of these triangles there's a little leather tab and it just kind of goes around it goes around the the two sides of the rope and as you push it down it pulls the ropes together at the top of that triangle so you wind up with a, a small triangle with with a line of two ropes going up from it. And so as you pull the ropes together in each of those triangles going around the drum, you're going to uh, increase the tension on the drum. So you're going to raise the pitch. Uh, mm. And uh, so the I don't know when ears were t- invented or, or became a common thing, but somewhere along the line, Somebody had the idea, and, and ears have taken a lot of forms. I mean, most frequently you see them made out of leather with with a number of different shapes. Uh, I've also seen them as metal rings, hmm. um, leather with sort of metal clips at the top. There's a bunch of different sort of iterations of that. Yeah, uh, but but that's the the basic uh, sort of function of, of the drum is is the rope goes around and 
and sort of get your your base tension you know think of it like with timpani clearing the head mm-hmm. and then as you as you move those ears up and down the ropes you're you're raising the pitch um so uh and well, as you, you, you know and let me ask you do you like just I'm talking then and now. Obviously, it's probably different stuff, but like, do you just use your hands to move the ears up? Can you get enough tension on like yeah. a modern snare? It, it, you can. Okay. Yeah. So with with modern drums, uh, modern rope tension drums, like what you might hear at uh, you know the the West Point Hellcats or the the U.S. Army Old Guard, uh, modern rudimental drum lines, they actually have Kevlar heads on those things, and we we tension them on a hydraulic press. So there's oh. there's really quite a lot of tension in these things, uh, but you can still push the ears up and down by hand. Cool. Um, now, part of that, too, has has to do with the design of the drum. You know, the shallower the drum, the more ears you want to put around, because, it, again, if you imagine those triangles, the wider the triangle is, the harder it is going to be to push that ear down mm-hmm. and the more likely the ear is to slip. So there's there's sort of a sweet spot for, for you know, how many ears you want to put around the drum or how many holes you're going to put in the hoop. So that, you know, you still have that, that tunability. Yeah, really. Can I also ask you real quick while we're here, before we move too far, like forward by definition, what is the difference between a Tabor as I'm Googling and kind of looking at them and moving into a rope tension, like snare drum? It looks like there's, there's like, like you said, there's no counter hoop. There's no actual, it's usually tensioned through the flesh hoop. And, um, what, what would you describe as being, you know, what makes one different from the other? It's sort of a gradual evolution. Uh, I mean, a Tabor is a snare drum, I suppose. It's a drum with a snare on it, right? Yeah. Um, I, I'm not really sure when the the snare moved to only on the bottom head. And I, I think that's kind of a one of the real defining characteristics oh, of, okay. of what we think of as a snare drum is you have a batter head and you have a snare side head and the snare on the bottom. Sure. Um, even looking at, at Jeremy Montague's book, uh, timpani percussion, which that and the James Blade book, I think, are like kind of, it, to me, the the most well researched books on on the history and evolution of these instruments. You know, even looking through there, uh, Jeremy Montague specifically says that like there there's no clear record of when that shift happened. Hmm. Um, but uh, but somewhere after the 16th century, uh, people stopped putting the snares on the batterhead. Oh, gotcha. And I would say if we're going to have a defining characteristic, I would say snares only on the bottom of the drum and that the drum has counter hoops. Got it. Yeah, that makes uh, sense. From looking at the pictures, it's like, it's like, and it looks almost more like, like the Tabor's almost more, I don't want to say tribal, but it looks like it has those roots it, it, as opposed to like a standardized, let's say in this case, like an American snare drum or not american but you know like a military which that's a great way to like you said before tabor and pipe versus fife and drum is military versus kind of romance or whatever you said that it yeah. seems pretty clear um yeah i mean that it, it was i it was more of a folk instrument I, it. I i yeah. think that's that's pretty fair to say um but uh yeah that um and like I said, the other thing is counter hoops. You know, I, I don't know when counter hoops really became a thing. Like, and I think all this stuff was gradual anyway. You sure. know, if you think about like the bass drums, right? So uh, bass drums sort of began similarly, but but they came more from from Turkey. So like when, when we start to see bass drums happening in like European music, it was probably like 18th century with composers like uh, Mozart and Haydn. And they were really influenced by... Turkish Janissary bands mm-hmm. and that that sort of military percussion, which would be like cymbals, uh, triangles, the Turkish crescent, which, uh, if you're unfamiliar, is basically a a big crazy like pole arm looking thing hmm. with bells and and jingles all over it. Um, we recently made one for the Handel and Haydn Society here in Boston, actually, which was cool. a super fun project. But um, <laughs> but that and these big kind of bass drums, which they called a davul, which I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but uh, a devul basically looks like a giant tabor, but with no snares. I I I can't say that they never did this, but I've never seen them with ears on them. But they didn't have counter hoops, to the best of my knowledge, the ones that I've researched anyway. And um, you know the, those uh, European composers who were in Vienna at the time, you know, they're really influenced by this this Turkish Janissary music, which uh, kind of makes sense because at the time, like that'd be the Ottoman Empire, right? Mm-hmm. Which like modern day Turkey's 
pretty far from Vienna, but like the Ottoman Empire at the time wasn't really that far. So for that influence to have sort of moved geographically kind of kind of makes sense. Sure. Um, but again, this is this is uh, we're in the 18th century now looking at these bass drums that didn't have counter hoops. Um, but uh, I know the 18th century military drums did. Right. So like if you look at the American Revolutionary War, you know, we we're we're in something that that is much more like what we would think of as a military snare drum. You know, these uh, kind of square sizes, like seventeen by seventeen, with counter hoops, with snares on the bottom, and uh, you know, I, I think that's kind of a, a sort of formative innovation as well. Like, how are the snares fastened? How are they adjusted? You know, we yeah. began with guts tied on, and then guts tensioned with friction pegs, and then somewhere along the line, we we got to this J hook. Which is um, is basically just a a, a, a J shaped hook with with a screw, and um, so on on the drum shell there was some sort of uh, of mount that this that this hook threaded this screw hook would go through, and then you'd tighten a little kind of wing nut type thing, and that would pull the hook up and thereby tension the snares. Hmm. Uh, so it. the snares would just be one strand of gut that went back and forth across the bottom of the drum like 10 or 12 times. Um, and yeah. that's a dramatic improvement over friction pegs, but it still kind of sucks in terms of adjustability and, and snare sensitivity and things like that. Yeah. And then when we get into the 19th century, we see something more like what, what we're familiar with, where you've actually got a pinch bar. So the the snares as individual strands get clamped onto this pinch bar, which can be raised and lowered with a screw. Uh, throw offs still didn't happen for a while. It was just snare strainers that you could tighten or loosen, but but no throw off. And, and I'm not exactly sure when throw offs really came into fashion. I'm I'm gonna say probably mid 19th century. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Well, or or later. I mean, even with Civil War drums, you never really see throw offs but i'm not really sure it with like orchestral instruments at that time yeah um, sure yeah, but definitely by late 19th century for it sure. seems i don't know this but it seems i don't know this at all i'm just totally guessing but it seems like one of those things where it would be like almost like a gladstone thing or like a like a george way thing where it's like you know let me put this thing that like a, like one of those crazy inventions yeah. that comes out yeah but, i mean those dudes yeah all kinds i mean gladstone in particular i mean it, it yeah. happened before him i'm course, sure but but sure. still he was such a great innovator and um but yeah, I mean, I, I would imagine it was kind of that that sort of thing where, especially when the drums are taken out of a military context, yeah, you know, and and put in an orchestral context, and now composers are really interested in the sounds and the ways you can play these things and extended techniques or whatever. And hmm. yeah, I imagine that's sort of how it happened. Sure. Well, so the J hook, I've wondered that for a long time because I've I've seen those old drums where you, your brain wants to kind of like like as a drum set guy, you want to call it. Uh, like you look and you go, oh, there's the throw off, but you know it's not a throw off. It's just a a, a, a way to f- basically control those guts that are on the bot, you know, the the snares. Uh, but so that's that's neat to find out about that. I, I yeah, no and it's just was you know, s- snare strainers existed for a long time before a throw off was added to exactly. That. Yeah, and yeah. Do you know where the term strainer comes from? I mean in in the the you know terminology of drumming you know i i don't i can only imagine it it has to do with um some strainers have have guts passing through individual holes punched on Mm. some sort of retainer yeah um kind of looks like a strainer that's (laughs) i sure i say this purely anecdotally i don't Mm -hmm. know that at all but that's sort of what i always kind of imagined was the sort of etymology of that word yeah that's a good point um, one thing too that I'm like, you know, I, I think it as you know, 2021 guys right now, we're just sitting here talking, but you kind of like take for granted sometimes that even the rope for these drums dating back as early as we've you know started with 11th and 12th century, like someone had to make the rope. I mean, it's like, yeah, <laughs> it, and making rope isn't easy. I mean, these are not like head out to like the local music store and pick one up, um, watching people make, I've seen some videos of like making medieval rope. Yeah. It's like, that's an all day thing. I mean, you're, it's just insane. I mean, it's not an easy process. So every bit of this is very, very, uh, um, I'm sure you don't treat your drum poorly. I'm sure it's very important to these people and you know, the player. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I, 
although I use very few historical or, or period manufacturing techniques, I do kind of geek out on that stuff. Yeah. And uh, yeah, man, some of the the craftsmanship from that time with the total lack of modern tools or, or methods or materials really blows my mind. Yeah. Uh, and and yeah, watching watching rope being made and like you know, the way they did it several hundred years ago is <laughs> pretty badass. Also, some of the machines they made back then, you know, the, these these belt driven or, or or gear driven, like really, really super clever. Like they were crazy good engineers. They just didn't have the stuff we have. You no. Know? Yeah, we're probably less <laughs> like we don't use our brains as much. And I've said it on a previous episode uh, a year or two ago, but there's a show called Secrets of the Castle, and I found it's on Amazon. I always watch it on YouTube, but it's these people where they're building a castle and it's, everything is period correct in France, and every single step of the way, everything is done like that, where it's making paint is out, done with all of Oof. the like, it's insane, making water wheels to make things turn and get that like... It's wild. So I yeah, recommend everyone. I'm, I'm going to have to check that out, man. I, I really, really love stuff like that. You'll love it. It has nothing to do with drums, but it's uh, it kind of does to make you appreciate things like this about. Yeah. I mean, yeah, all, all these different assets. Like I said, you know, I, I'm such an instrument nerd and I, you know, being a, a brass player, I have all these all these, you know, instruments dating back between 100 and 200 years. And I just I just love this stuff. I. I love learning about how how these things were made and why, and and that that interest extends to armor in particular. Yeah, um, which uh, yeah, I'm definitely that nerd. Oh, yeah. um, it's cool, but uh, but all kinds of things, you know, building houses, building anything. I I don't know. I think it's really cool. I do too. We're all most people listening to the show are nerds. Um, yeah, <laughs> so we're, and we're we're happy about it. Or we're, we're in good company. Yeah. All right. So um, maybe one thing, too, that like uh, we haven't glossed over it, but obviously, like you can't have a drum without hitting a head. So Mm -hmm. the the animal skin, the calf skin or whatever kind of animal it was, um, that's a whole interesting process there. That's an hour long two. that's multiple hour long episodes in itself. But maybe touch on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I I really don't know anything about tanning hides. I I can say that, you know, things that are, are. now done with with chemicals at the time we're done with with vegetables or um actually i think that they there was some something from like a cow's brain there was some Mm. enzyme or something that they would use i i might be making that up but i'm pretty sure i'm not yeah Uh, but but the process is crazy but um yeah i mean any kind of animal hide was was sort of fair game for these things i mean obviously we think of calf and goat as most common yeah. Uh, but in some parts of the world, they use fish skin. Um, oh, that's crazy, man. I mean, I, I would love to try one of those someday, but I guess they don't come around. Uh, you know, I'm in Cincinnati. Yeah. Not many fish drums floating around. In, uh, <laughs> yeah, I know, right. Honestly, I don't even know what, what culture that's from. I just I just know that it's a thing that exists. Yeah. Um, and like I said, th- this is such an infant topic, man. Like you could never know all this stuff. And and my experience is with this is very Eurocentric just because of like my own music education and uh, my own interest in like like this country's history and and European history and stuff like that, but it's I mean it's such a huge hugely broad topic and really cool all the all the different sort of innovations and in how these instruments were made and why and oh you know, yeah really cool yeah cool well um, so getting back on track here with the rope tension stuff um, I think we were kind of in the uh, 18th century yeah like, yeah sort of the the Mozart and Hamilton yeah and type. While yeah. we're going, so so the the ten, rope tension drums would typically be a snare drum and a bass drum. Is that correct? Yeah, I don't know when. Well, okay, and timpani. So and timpani. Um, I don't know when tenor drums became a thing. I I, I think tenor drums were always a thing. It was just a, a drum that didn't have a snare on it. Like the way we think of like there's snares and there's toms and there's bass drums. I just I don't think those distinctions were were particularly clear because like. We only have those distinctions because it's what composers call for, whether we think of a composer in the um, orchestral sense or a composer in terms of like, I don't know, Dave Grohl, like he's got his toms, his kick and his snare, right? Yeah. Um, it, you know, the the term composer can be used really broadly and, and we use the instruments that composers call for. So, you know, before that, I don't know, performance practice became standardized, like 
you know, who it's, it's just a drum, man. This is what this drum sounds like. Like, mm-hmm. so, um, but timpani are a separate thing. So, sure. uh, some sort of kettle drum, the, the predecessor of the modern timpani was something called a naker or knacker. I'm not sure how it's pronounced, but, uh, the earliest depictions of that that I'm familiar with are like 10th or 11th century. And they were copper bowls, maybe like 10 inches or so in diameter. And I don't know, like like six to eight inches deep, probably. And you see a lot of, of depictions of people playing these things. We have two of them just like hanging off their belt. Two drums appear to be about the same size. Uh, there seems to be some argument, you know, when, when you kind of read about these things. Uh, historians kind of disagree about, you know, why why were there two drums, right? Were they different pitches? Were they different sounds? Uh, the general consensus seems to be that the the rather than having two different pitches, like they didn't really care what the pitches were. It was yeah. more two different sounds. Mm-hmm. I've seen at least one depiction where the two drums, one had a snare across the top. Oh, cool. Um, I've seen, uh, well, I, I've read some, some people sort of uh, theorizing that, you know, one drum was vented and one drum wasn't so that one drum, you know, would, would have a different sound quality. Like one would ring and one would be dead, except I don't know if you've ever like plugged the hole in the bottom of, of a, of a, a tympano, you know that it doesn't change the sound. So, um, you know, that, that can't be it unless there was something more to it. Sure. Um, yeah. So, uh, but those instruments, you know, it was these very small copper bowl, single headed drums and, and because the bottom was was closed, you know, that's sort of like, to me, one of the defining things about timpani, right? Like the bottom's closed, which means the, the fundamental frequency is is phase canceled. So you're only hearing from the second partial up. And, you know, that is a defined, like, like I say, snares, toms, bass drums, I don't know. They were just drums until composers sort of codified what those things are. But uh, timpani are different because the bottom is closed. And so therefore you don't hear the fundamental frequency. Um, so to me, that is the one thing that historically has always been its own category. You know what I mean? Got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so yeah. yeah. So, sense. and those, those are originally rope tension too. And, and eventually th- those drums got, got larger and, um, you know, another sort of effect of, of the closed bottom, like you lose the fundamental frequency, but also the, the pitch and sustain are, are more clearly defined. And so then, you know, eventually what we know of as timpani were born. Um, but yeah, in terms of like tenor drums or things like that, yeah, I don't, I, I think that was more driven by composers than sure. anything else. Yeah, less, and I mean, it, it obviously seems like now we're more in the, this is used for military or like brass bands and things like that, yeah. kind of in this, the, the century that we're discussing now. So, okay, yeah. that's good to know. Then uh, carry on. Where do we go from there with the, the evolution of this stuff? Um. So at this at this area, my my knowledge and from an orchestral perspective gets pretty fuzzy, but from a military perspective, I, I you know I, I know a little bit more. So if we're if we're looking at like the 18th century around the time of the American Revolutionary War, like most commonly you would see drums that were square sizes, somewhere between 16 by 16 and 18 by 18. Uh, of course, st- sizes weren't standardized because it's not like they were mass-produced heads. Like you make the drum, then you make the flesh hoop, then you tuck the calf skin on it. Who cares what size? It's whatever size you want it to be. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but generally speaking, somewhere between 1616 and 1818 was really common. Uh, these drums, like we said before, did have counter hoops and some kind of snare strainer with snares on the bottom. Uh, in the American Revolutionary War, there there weren't any bass drums. You see like fife and drum groups and stuff and groups doing sort of like period and like historically informed performance from that time period, they often use bass drums because that sounds good, but, but they, they didn't, that wasn't a thing. Um, especially not with field music, which makes sense. Cause how practical is a bass drum on a battlefield? You know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, like that's it's a bad idea. <laughs> no, that's the core of a lot of this stuff is like, it's no, it's seriously, it has to be practical. There's no yeah. one cares if you're like, don't hit the drummer. It's like, no, you can't walk around with a, 36 inch bass drum or <laughs> yeah it's, it's just not it's not going to happen no um and, and in fact you know the, the way drums were used in terms of battlefield communication there's even well i mean there's treatises and stuff and stuff written on this but there's a lot of popular misconception like the the sort of like romanticized idea of the little drummer boy just wasn't nearly as much of a thing as our culture these days would you know have you 
have you believe. Um, but, uh, but, but yeah, using, using drums and fifes and drums, uh, both for battlefield communication and for, you know, just soldiers entertainment, things like that. But I think that tradition actually comes from Switzerland. Uh, and I think it was brought here by that dude, uh, that dude that, um, Oh, I can't remember his, his name, but who who came to help George Washington, and basically took the the Continental Army and just trained them like they were yeah. they were a mess. And this dude, this Swiss dude, came. And in fact, speaking of rope drums, uh, rudimental drumming in Switzerland, they have it's is a very very rich tradition. And fife and drum in Switzerland is like crazy popular. There's this festival every year called Foshnot, which is a giant party of fife and drum, and everybody's super into it. And yeah, it's 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 a very popular uh, tradition there. But the to the best of my knowledge, that uh, the use of fife and drum in a military context comes from Switzerland. That was brought to this country via this dude who helped. There's even a, there's an episode of Drunk History about this. It's hilarious. I just can't remember the guy's name. It's not uh, Friedrich Wilhelm von Steuben. Yes, is it? it is. Okay, yeah, I just that pulled guy. that off the top of my head. I did not Google that. Nice. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Of course I Googled that. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you are correct. Yes. <laughs> that guy. Yeah. So although he was not a musician, uh, he is he is at least, to the best of my knowledge, partially responsible for the fact that uh, we in this country have uh, used drums as part of our military tradition. Hmm. So we see we see those drums and and if you look at in so these Drums from that period, in this country at least, everything that I've ever seen was made of wood, most typically steam bent, um, with re-rings, of course, because you, you need them when something's sure. steam bent. There were some drums that must have been made by Coopers at the time that were stave drums, because they, they really just look like barrels with heads on them. But uh but you know, when you think about it at that time, you know, they needed drums and anybody who was a decent woodworker could, you know, come up with something, right? Yeah. Yeah, um, really. And uh but in in Europe at the time there's a lot more brass shells, um shallower drums. Uh I I I'm not real clear where we are in history, but like if you look at the French Revolution um so I had to do I had to do a reproduction of one of those one of the drums like the um from the Bastille and it was a it ended up being a was it 14 by 16 brass? Uh, they roped the drum slightly differently. Hmm. Uh, yeah, it was a really cool drum. That's awesome. Uh, 14 by 16 is an awesome size for a rope tension field drum, by the way. Cool. Um, but uh, but speaking of that, in this country, as we get towards the Civil War uh, into the 19th century, the military drums became shallower, which kind of makes a lot of sense because you know you get you get that faster articulation, like you 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 know shorten the drum and. You have a little less body to the sound, but but the articulation becomes more clear, and there's sort of that more immediate response. Um, and uh, in fact, there, there's what's referred to as the, the contract size, like the mm. contract drum, which was the, the Union Army. The Confederate Army was obviously a, a lot less regulated, just because that's was their situation. The Union Army more so. So the Union contracted an, a number of manufacturers to make. Uh, drums for for Union Army regiments. Those were typically 12 by 16, 12 by 17. Uh, I can't remember exactly what the contract specified. Now I think mm. about it. I probably should look that up before we talk. But No, but I, um, I, I think in the Noble and Cooley episode, they kind of talked about that. Um, oh, probably. They made some of them. Yeah, they were like, they went from toy company to drum company and then back to toy company um, yeah. in that kind of span there. But uh, But yeah, that's super interesting. And I think like uh, like Soisman and, and Eli Brown, uh, as I recall, going going back to that time period of the drums that you you see a lot of. Um, Eli Brown drums are are kind of what I what I think people in the in this sort of rudimental drumming community sort of look at. It's kind of like the Stradivarius of hmm. of rope tension drums. Really, um, I've yet to get my hands on one, but uh, but they're they're really cool instruments. Um, but yeah, so we get into this time period, and, and so the drums are shallower. And uh, and the snare systems have changed, so now we're into instead of using the J hooks, we have a, a pinch bar which is which is holding individual snare strands on the on one side and some kind of snare anchor on the other, which is frequently just a piece of leather with holes punched in it. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and uh, that was actually a pretty great innovation because it is a dramatically more responsive snare system than the J hook was. It's easier to adjust. Uh, it's just, it just works a lot better. Yeah. Still no throw offs, but it was, uh, it was just a definite improvement. Uh, we also see bass drums, not on the battlefield, of course, but military bands at the time would would have bass drums and snare drums and cymbals, actually. I've definitely mm. seen uh, photos of Civil War bands with bass, snare, and cymbals. Yeah, makes uh, sense. I mean, it's it kind of goes back to the Janissary bands in uh, Turkey where it's like, you know, you want to be big and loud and uh, yeah. show off and cymbals certainly are loud. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think that, you know, I, I don't know to what degree sort of that, that kind of like battlefield intimidation or, yeah, or sure. off battlefield intimidation was came into play as much as it was, uh, you know, entertaining the troops or serving as kind of a status symbol when they, when the, the uh, a regiment would come to a place yeah, or whatever. I, you know, I, I think that they had a lot of uses just as military musical ensembles do today. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it definitely it definitely did evolve. We still had fifes in the Civil War, but it kind of that kind of gave way to bugles at some point around there. Th- there were still fifes, but bugles became a lot more of a thing for for military communication. Um, but uh, but yeah, that that's when we like to me we're kind of getting into a much more what we think of as a modern snare drum. Yeah, it's still rope tension, but. The snare strainers are are closer to what we think of as as modern stuff, and um, you know, obviously we're still using skinheads for for a long time. But, sure, yeah. But the drums are getting kind of the sizes are getting more like what we think of as a marching snare, and uh, it's, yeah. it's getting closer, you know, to what we recognize. Well, it seems like you know you have to find out what works. You have to find out what should become more standardized and it's like okay this works we can quit like kind of like now i mean it's like we like the modern day drum set it's not really changing that much because it's pretty effective and it works well for everyone and it's standardized and all that um so but there's still trends you know it's oh, like in the 80s super deep toms were cool and yeah, then you know for sure now they're not like <laughs> they will be again we all know it <laughs> oh, of course you know but uh but that's like you know th- these these kinds of trends like it's not all you, util- I guess what I'm trying to say is it's not all utility. Like yeah. even in these military situations, there were still like, like style and trends and things like that, that people just, they thought it was cool. So this is what we're doing now, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of style and trends and stuff, um, well, I guess it wouldn't be trends, but uh, I really like looking at the various, uh, like artwork, the painting on the side of the drums. I mm-hmm. think that's awesome. And just to kind of think of, it's someone it's not you know laser etched on or like screen printed on it's someone painted those drums you know that's yeah what a cool job yeah um there's uh there's a lot of surviving examples of that i think it was a little less common um historically than than what surviving examples might Mm. suggest but also a lot of people you know soldiers they're like what else you got to do right (laughs) i'm gonna paint wherever (laughs) i've been on my drum like yeah um, that was definitely a thing. There are some surviving drums that on the inside of the drum have a lot written about like kind of like a, a almost a, a diary, not shaking your drum apart every day. Cause especially with a rope tension drum, it's a I was giant pain in the ass, but just thinking that I was like, um, every night he's like, okay, here we yeah. go. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh my God. No. <laughs> but like, but you know, you'll, you'll find some of these instruments with on the inside is some kind of record written out. Um, and speaking of, of painting, if, uh, if if anyone out there is is interested in having artwork painted on their drum, there is an artist named Virginia Wilco Stafford in uh, Middleton, Connecticut, hmm. who is pretty much she's she's the one. Um, there's a, there's a handful of people uh, around here that do it for the rope drum community who are quite good, but in my opinion, yeah, Virginia's where it's at. So you can look her up; she's awesome. Cool. Um, but. Uh, also, uh, we're, we're currently working on a set of drums for West Point for the Hellcats. And um, uh, Virginia was unavailable. And we had the guys at Woodshed Stage Art actually print direct to the veneer that we're using for the outside ply of the drum shells, hmm. which is a super cool technology that I yeah. didn't even know was possible. Uh, but it looks awesome. Man. So um, 
Yeah. Speaking speaking of, of artwork, you know, it's interesting to think about like everything else, you know, the way we do that has changed too. Like, yeah. And uh, I don't know. It's, it's cool. Like the, the progression of innovation of all these things, it's, it's really neat. Yeah. It's more graphic design at that level of yeah. laying it out and then uh, um, cool. Well, so we're in the civil war era then now, right? I mean, yeah. I, I think it's kind of like, oh, I guess we were doing the American revolution and then, you know, and on, but so civil war from episodes I've done in the past, um, it's like, that is a very, very, like, I guess maybe I like how you're dropping some of the like misconceptions out there, but like a lot of times people think of that as being like the heyday of, of modern, you know, rope tension drums. But like, maybe that's just cause we see that the most as like, American guys, obviously you're in Boston, I'm in Cincinnati. We see that of like, um, civil war rope tension drums. That's what happened. But after that, it sort of withered out as being the, like the, the, the go-to form of, you know, military issued tension on the drums. Is that sort of correct? You know, I don't know when the switch to rod tension happened. I mean, I think that a lot of why we we think of it that way, as you described, is because there's photographs from the Civil War, you know, and and then after the war, like, I don't know, how many photographs of orchestras are you looking at? Like, how many photographs of an orchestra (laughs) are you going to find in a history textbook? You know what I mean? Yeah, really? Um, From 1870. Like, uh, but it was definitely still a thing. And, um, you know, I would say, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s, I'm not really sure when the first rod tension drums happened. I, I think. Um, I think it kind of came from banjos. Yeah, uh, I think you're I, right. I think as like kind of that's how banjo pots were made with with the the screw tension, and and then they started applying that to drums. And um, that might not not have been the the first, but I I think that that was sort of one of the significant influences to switching to that system of tension. Hmm. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And the banjo as has been discussed on the show before, was like an immensely popular uh, instrument oh, yeah. back in the day. I mean, I think a lot of times, too, it's because it just cuts really clearly in the, you know, through. Oh, yeah. In, in an acoustic setting. Yeah, the, the frequency content of that, it makes it just cut a lot better than a guitar. Yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, so so rope tension drums did fall out of favor. Uh, one, one thing I'm sure that, in fact, I think you've even heard you mention this in, in past episodes. Uh, so, you know, we get into the, into the 1900s and we're solidly like rope tension is, is fully passe until we get to world war two. And this is something that's always been really fascinating to me. So in, in world war two, there were so, there was so much, um, sort of like nationwide involvement in the war effort, you know, Mm -hmm. and everybody had their victory gardens and, and, and all, and all this stuff and, and the, the war rationing and all that. Well, all manufacture in the U.S. was sort of uh, subject to these these laws of, of war rationing. So there was a law that said any product manufactured in the United States could not be more than ten percent metal by um, by weight. Mm-hmm. So um, that was a real problem for music instrument manufacturers, right? Because there's a lot of metal in in many instruments at the time. You know, metal snare drums and things were really popular, and um, you know, they're like those you know, like the Barry bass drums, right? The collapsible bass drums and stuff for sure. like, for like, you know, gigging drummers and uh, metal drums were really popular. And so when World War II came and, and all of a sudden there's all this metal rationing and now they can't use metal anymore, uh, all music instrument manufacturers had a problem. So the brass instrument manufacturers like Kahn and King or whatever, they retooled. So instead of like trumpets and trombones and tubas and stuff, they, they were making artillery shells out of brass. Yeah, but uh, yeah. the drum companies sort of uh, addressed this two ways. There was, uh, for like drum sets and things, they just, they just made everything out of wood, wooden lugs and wooden hoops and wooden everything. So you got like the rolling bombers that what was that Slingerland, I think. Slingerland. Yeah. And, uh, like the victory series. I think that was Leedy maybe. I, I know there was victory. I think I might be wrong, but victory, I think was Ludwig. And I think victorious was WFL. I remember yeah. that. Cause I'm like, come on guys. <laughs> Le- Leedy had one too. I can't remember. I think you're right about Ludwig. I can't remember what the Leedy yeah, one. The dreadnought. It could be dreadnought. So for, for, uh. For drum sets, that's what we did, but the, for marching drums, it went back to rope tension. So the U.S. Army commissioned, uh, 
that I know of, they commissioned WFL and Gretsch to make uh, their marching snare drums. They were 12 by 15. And uh, I know they commissioned WFL to make four or 5,000. I don't know how many they commissioned Gretsch. But hmm. I've actually restored a bunch of these now, like probably four or five of the WFLs and three of the Gretsch. Nice. And uh, it's really interesting, you know, they... You know, it's just they're they're basically made the, the same as they were before. It's just like they couldn't use metal. So, yeah, rope tension works That's out great. Awesome. Yeah. Um, the WFL is actually, if you ever see one of these, they're usually not that expensive when you find them on eBay and stuff. Uh, but if you find one of those WFL drums from World War II, they're awesome. Like the couple that I've restored have turned out just really, really great drums. And it's interesting. So you look on the inside and you there's clear evidence that they were hastily made. You know what I mean? Like there's yeah. glue drips and stuff. And it's like, you know, when, when you open the drum up, you're like, wow, man, this was, this was done in a hurry, but they sound crazy good. They're awesome. The Gretsch ones, they're okay. Um, yeah. They're decent, you know, but, but the WFL world war two marching snares are killer. Uh, those are cool too, because even the snare strainer, like the, the mount for the snare strainer is made out of maple. The, oh. the screw and the, the thing that actually holds the snares, those are both made out of metal, but, um, and there's metal on the, uh, on the ears. There's like a metal clip at the top of the ears, but other than that, it's all wood. And, uh, yeah, it's just, it's really interesting to me to, to sort of look at how musical instrument manufacturers handled those challenges and, oh yeah and looking at those, those military drums from that time period. They're, they're really cool. Yeah. I didn't, I mean, you're right. That has we. I love talking about that topic on this show, but I, I really didn't know too much about the the rope tension kind of making a comeback, which makes perfect sense. It's like you know, why not? Uh, yeah, why not do that now? Okay, so talking about then and now almost, but like, does a rope tension drum? And I feel like your answer is going to be yes because you're the rope tension guy here. But like, <laughs> does it have a place within a dr- as a drum set player? Or is it primarily just really for marching? Um, I mean, it seems like the obvious answer is it's duh, it's for marching. But would could you integrate it into a drum set? You know, obviously in the forties, yeah. fifties, or now, really? Yeah. If um, I so I made one. I'm actually making another one right now. A uh, fully rope tension drum set. If yes. you if you go on YouTube and you you search uh, Mike Dawson Calderwood nice. rope tension, yeah, it's you'll awesome. find uh, he he did a, a review. I don't know if it ever made it in the magazine. I can't remember if they published that one or not, but um, he did he did a review of a rope tension drum set I made a while ago. But um, yeah, so for a couple reasons, rope tension drums are cool because for one thing they have free floating shells, right? So you know you have some some additional resonance there, and um, because there's no metal on the drum, the overall like there's less mass in total, which means the resonant frequency of the whole system is lower. So it can, it can um, support lower tunings and still resonate without like getting flappy or like farting out. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you have a wider tuning range and uh, with the, because they're free floater or honestly, I don't, I don't even know why it's just like a function of, of the way the instrument behaves. They, they're not pitched like timpani or pitched or anything like that, but they have sort of a, a little bit more clarity to the, to the, to the tone or to the pitch. Mm. Um, there's also an interesting thing where tuning wise, although the rope doesn't like slip around the drum, well, there are some where it does, but, but generally speaking, that's not, that's not really a thing. Nevertheless, the tension around the drum kind of evens itself out sort of. Mm. So they're really easy to tune. But one of the really cool things about a rope tension drum set is that on the kick drum and the floor tom in particular, you can do pitch bends. Kind of like oh, on a rotor tom. Cool. Yeah. So like with a floor tom, if you hit it and just grab one or two, but but really just one will do it. Grab one ear and push it down. You'll get a solid pitch bend. And um, awesome. You can all like with a kick drum, for instance, while you're playing the the top three ears across the top of the drum, which you can totally reach. You know, you can go from like a real tight punchy sound to like super low and flappy just by shoving those three ears all the way out to the end of the drum. Hmm. So, like, while you're playing, you can dramatically change tunings. Um, yeah. Or in between songs, you know, you can go from from a big flappy sounding kick drum to something real tight and jazzy. Uh, they, you, they're super fast and easy to tune because you just move the ears up and down. And um, 
And mm, e- awesome. even moving one ear can have a big effect. Just like with a rod tension drum, like if you detune one lug, you, you can't really fully detune one side of the drum with just unscrewing one lug. And yeah. even if you were going to do that, it still takes a while to fully unscrew one, one tension rod, you know? Yeah, and it's loud. You're yeah. clanking and it's awkward and you drop, then you drop it. You drop your tuning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Invariably you drop the drum key or tension rod falls yeah. out or something. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, with a rope tension drum, you just, you just grab one of those leather ears and just, just push it up or down on the drum and you can change tunings totally on the fly. So for, you know, like the jazzers that like to get really cute about having super melodic mm-hmm. uh, solos, you know, or like trying to quote part of the head or something like it's, you know, it's effectively like a slide whistle at that point where you can just grab an ear and move it up and down to get the pitches you want. That's awesome. Um, yeah, th- there's really cool applications. It, it's they sound great, and um, and if you're interested in those kind of like fast tuning changes, uh, I mean, changing heads is kind of a pain, but um, you get used to it. It really doesn't take that long if you if you do it a lot. Um, yeah, I mean, sure. I can change heads on a rope drum in like 20 minutes. Um, not too but, far off from you know if you're kind of yeah. taking. If you're not like using a drill and doing it super fast, that's not that far off from like, um, yeah, from, from a regular. Roger. I mean, that's me yeah. going as fast as I can. So it's, you know, it's not exactly a one to one to one comparison, but, <laughs> yeah. but I mean, the point is it, it's not that big of a deal sure. to change heads, but, but that is, that is definitely the, the downside. Um, but, but yeah, it, it does give you an interesting, an interesting dynamic instrument in a, in a drum set context. And they're beautiful. And you have the yeah, cool, cool factor <laughs> of like, no one else is going to be like, oh man, he's got, and I love them, but like, oh, he's got a CNC kit too, mm-hmm. which are awesome drums, but it's like, they're very popular. No one, there's not, you know, if you show up at a gig and two guys have complete rope tension drum sets, then that's <laughs> that, like, I don't know, buy a lottery that, ticket. That would or something. be crazy. Yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, man, that's awesome. You're, you're doing some beautiful work here. Um, so as we're getting close to the end here, I want to just kind of say real quick, did I miss anything? Are we you know, is there anything else in the history of this? Uh, have you seen, so we, we talked about world war two and then after that, was it sort of kind of still a, uh, a little bit of a, a niche kind of thing? I, I'm not aware of any mass production of rope tension drums after world war two. Okay. Um, you know, the fife and drum activity kind of held on throughout and there are manufacturers here and there. And of course, Cooperman was an industry standard for a very long time. And, uh, Eames for, for a long time, like in the seventies was, was making a lot of cool drums and, um, and, you know, uh, Gus Moeller, you know, made those and, mm-hmm. and Andy Reamer, uh, Andy, no, Bill Reamer, his son, Andy Reamer, he's the timpanist in the what Pittsburgh symphony. I think, uh, he still makes rope drums too, but kind of only as a side thing, his dad, Bill Reamer, uh, who had drummers, drummer service, I think in, uh, in Pennsylvania, um, if you've ever seen the the LA Philharmonic, they have that huge, just beautiful rope tension concert bass drum. Uh, I I can't remember if it was Bill or Andy Reamer who made that, but it's a Reamer drum. Hmm. So you know th- there have been people making these things all along, but but to the best of my knowledge, there's no mass production of of rope tension drums since World War II. Gotcha. Well. Even further than you are doing a great thing by by uh, amongst the names you just mentioned, keeping the tradition going um, and all that great stuff. So um, what got you into this? How did you get into these super old school, you know, type of drums? Uh, it kind of kind of from a, a few different angles, actually. I've always been super into to history. A particular area of interest for me has always been the Civil War. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was born in Texas was there until I think I was nine. We, my family moved to New Hampshire. So uh, having lived on both sides of the Mason Dixon line, it's been a really interesting perspective on, on learning about the civil war and, and sort of the history of this country. And I find all that stuff really, really interesting. And uh, I'm just super, super passionate about musical instruments, man. I just, I really, really love musical instruments and, and the history and, and how they evolved and why they evolved that way. And, and how like, literature for those instruments impacted the design of instruments and vice versa. And, mm. and all that stuff has always been really interesting to me. And in fact, when I was like, I think 15 or 16, I, I found some old, like, like an old, uh, lady, probably like 12 by 14 marching style, like one of those, like from the fifties, that mm-hmm. was like single tension, you know, and yeah. like drilled holes in the hoops and like made my own rope tension drum, which can yeah, kind of worked. Um, <laughs> But uh, more recently, the kind of specific impetus for this was I was teaching the uh, the 4H 
Fife and Drum Corps in uh, here in Massachusetts. And uh, I'd never, I've never been involved with the fife and drum activity before. I didn't really know much about it. But a friend of mine, who's a really fantastic fifer, she was teaching the, she was teaching the fife line of this group, and she'd lost her drum instructor. And so we were talking about that. I was like, oh, you know, I, I could probably do it. And she's like, you, you do rudimental drumming, and I was like, well, you know, I mean, uh, I'm not familiar with that style, but I mean, I've taught drum lines before. Like, how hard can it be? <laughs> Yeah. Um, as, as most things, when you say, how hard can it be? Uh, <laughs> it's hard. I was, I was surprised. Um, yeah. but I mean, you know, drumming is drumming and, and rudiments are rudiments. And, and although the, the style is, is very, very different from like, it, you know, if you're, if you're marked DCI or whatever, like it's a really different style, but I mean, you know, it's still a drum line trying to play clean beats. Right. So, yeah. um, yeah, so I started teaching this drum line and, and I, I learned a lot. Uh, I'm also not a drummer, by the way. I'm sure we'll talk about that eventually. But um, what? Why are you on this show, dude? <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Um, I mean, I play drums, obviously, yeah. and, and I, I've got a lot of experience teaching drums, uh, mostly from my my roommates and best friends in college, all being percussion majors. Um, I actually went to college for tuba, but uh, <laughs> cool. anyway. Uh, so I, I taught. I've taught a lot of drum lines. I've written a lot of drum line books and stuff like that. So I I started teaching with with uh, my friend Lacey at. 4H5 and drum corps. And yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. I learned a lot. We, we, we did a lot of cool stuff, but their drum line was these like ancient Coopermans that were just beat to hell, man. Mm -hmm. And so there's not a lot of people around that can really work on these things or fix these things and taking them to Cooperman wasn't really very practical. And I was like, man, I know I can do this. So I started taking them apart and I just kind of figured it out and, you know, did, did a lot of work on them. Uh, came up with a way to make a, a drum press using just like a Harbor Freight uh, shop press. Cool. And yeah, I just, just kind of figured it out. And then as I was doing this, I was like, yeah, you know, I, I bet I could, I bet I could make these. And I'd already been making conventional rod tension drums for a little while. And, uh, and then the, the thing that really started it was when I was teaching the younger brother of, of one of the, the bass drummers was this kid named Dunny. He was five years old at the time and he had this little toy drum with like just skin heads tacked on both sides. And he would play this thing constantly. And like, as a five-year-old, this kid was like actually pretty good. I mean, you know, he'd be playing like in, in the the side of the the uh, gym or I think it was a, no, it was a cafeteria of, of like mm -hmm. a middle school where we rehearsed. And he'd be there like playing along. And obviously, you know, he's not like really playing the parts, but like he's actually getting the accents and, and kind of, you know, super precocious kid. Like, yeah, cool. Um, yeah, it was, it was really cool. But he uh, he put a stick through one of the heads on his his little drum, and the kid was just like beside himself, <laughs> like inconsolable. Oh, so his mom comes to me, and she's like, "Can you fix this?" And I was like, "Yeah, I can." But um, I bet I could just make him a new drum that was like a child size replica of the drums his big brother and the group are using. And so I did. I made an eight by eight rope tension snare drum. For this, for this, it's, it's, and you know, I, I finished it to match the, the drums that the, the older kids were using and it was, it was adorable, but that was the first rope tension drum that I made was this, mm. this little tiny eight inch by eight inch for this kid. And, and I was fun, you know, I had to like custom, like I had to fabricate all the snare hardware and all the everything because it was so tiny. And, um, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, that, that was the first one I did. And then I was like, this is this is cool, man. Like, I, I, I don't know. I, I really kind of got into it and started making more. And, um, you know, years later, I, that's this, that's what I do now. <laughs> yeah, really, man. And they are, um, just beautiful, beautiful drums, which it's a neat thing that there's so many ways to tension a drum over yeah. the history of the instrument. Um, let's take a quick side note. And I, I, I before we wrap up, I want to give a thank you. Um, so I don't forget to, I, I know him as a single name, uh, Mr. Bales. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he just came in as the, an email of saying Bales, which was like, well, that's yeah, cool. Br Brian Bales. He, he just, we all call him Bales. Okay. His name has been revealed. Brian Bales. Yeah. <laughs> um, thanks for suggesting this um, with Bill. Cause obviously, you know, again, we met, we've talked, but things just like, there's so many yeah. of the little like irons in the fire where I'm glad sometimes it takes a poke to. Um, yeah, man, life happens. Like, what are you going to do? Well, yeah, exactly. We, we both have young uh, kids and yeah. have been um, doing the dad duty. So, um, 
Now, um, Bill, where can people find out more information and see your beautiful drums and, you know, everything about you? So the website is just calderwoodpercussion.com. Um, we've got a lot of stuff on YouTube. Uh, also, uh, just under, you know, youtube.com slash calderwoodpercussion, I think. Um, yeah. And if you look on YouTube, you'll find a lot of uh, just product demos, you know, people playing the instruments. I used to be really good about doing shop updates and then, you know, pandemic happened. And so we've been trying to do, you know, we, we used to be really good about doing shop updates pretty regularly, but like, you know, pandemic happened and, and so that's been a little bit more kind of catch as catch can, but we're going to try and do more of that. But there's a lot of uh, sort of build videos and, and showing how we make stuff and, and, and why, and, and things like, um, you know, oh, we got this drum in here for repairs and, and we can't tune it because the bearing edges are all messed up and this is how we're going to fix it. And, so we try to have some stuff that that is uh, kind of educational and and sort of like practical to be like, hey, you know, some of this is DIY stuff. Like you can, you know, if your drum has this problem, here's how you fix it. Hmm, cool. And um, or if you know you look at the that and you're like, ah, that's not a project I want to do. You can send it to us, and that's cool. Um. So yeah, on on YouTube we have kind of a wide variety of things, and uh, if you're a fan of of the show Hamilton, there's a few videos there on on how we make the drums that are in that show. Um, yeah. And uh, oh, and we're we're actually working on a build video that we of course filmed a while ago, but never got around to editing. For we made this this monstrous um, ninety inch bass drum for Auto University in Kansas. So there's a build yes. video for that one coming, which which should be pretty pretty cool because that's kind of ridiculous. Well, um, so Bill, you kind of. Uh... You're, you're, I, I'm, I'm glad you're revealing my, uh, what was going to be my, this is what we're going to talk about on the Patreon bonus episode was the, oh yeah the amazing, uh, you know, your role as making drums with Hamilton, the movie and the musical, which are kind of obviously one and the same, but, um, uh, and how that all worked, how you got involved with that. And then also I want to hear about that gigantic drum, which I remember kind of thumbing through your. You had like a photo album of it. Um, yeah. <laughs> and it's just <laughs> mind blowing. So cool, man. Um, yeah. Well, we'll talk about that in a minute then. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, YouTube and, and the webpage um, on Facebook, it's just Calderwood Percussion. On Instagram, it's at Calderwood Drums. Um, I'm not so good about Facebook. I'm pretty good about Instagram. Um, try to be pretty good about YouTube. Oh, also on Bale's page. Uh, Bale's has been, well, he's been here in the show. Bale's, he, he works here. Um, I mean, we've been friends forever. We played in bands and stuff together, and uh, he was kind of part of Calderwood Percussion when it first started. And then, you know, like you say, life happens, and he was doing other things for a while. And and now he's back in the shop, usually a couple days a week, and he's been doing kind of like shop day videos. And uh, so on cool. his YouTube, which I think is Bales Five Thousand on YouTube, um, if you're interested in watching stuff get made, you know, we we make a lot of stuff. Yeah, um, that's awesome. So yeah, if you're interested in checking checking out, you know what what we're doing here, and um, you know, rope tension is my thing. Historical stuff is my thing. But we make everything, man. You know, um, all if you hit it to make music, we'll 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 make one. So yeah, that's cool. I, yeah. That's what in our you know early conversations. That's what I learned is like, okay, yeah, you're not just a drummer. You're you're a full on you know enthusiast master builder. I don't want, I don't go throw on the, the the word master here, but uh, <laughs> but but uh, we do the best we can, and um, uh, yeah. I, I think we we are students of of the of the, the art form. Oh yeah, but um, for sure. But but cool. yeah, I mean you know trying trying to come at this from from a, a pretty diverse perspective and and kind of a well rounded sort of musical background and. Um, yeah, man, we're just yeah. we're huge nerds for instruments. Well, I think you're doing a good job, and and I just want to spell so it's C A L D E R W O O D Calderwood Percussion. Um, and as I mentioned before, like usual on most episodes in the you know recent couple months, um, we are going to do a Patreon bonus episode, which will be ten minutes, usually fifteen minutes, where if you um. You know, if you pay two bucks, five bucks, a little extra money um, every month, you get some cool bonus content, early episodes. And Bill is going to tell us about, uh, like we discussed, his involvement in Hamilton, which was just like a, you know, mega success um, and the gigantic mega bass drum that he built. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, um, on that note, Bill, I want to just close this out and say thank you so much for joining me. And thanks to Bales for uh, getting us in touch. Um, 
And uh, yeah, everyone check out Calderwood Percussion. Thanks, Bill. Yeah. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. It's been fun. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning.